Hello, and a very warm welcome to another class of the seminar Organizing in Times of Crisis, the case of war and armed conflict. My name is Blagoj Blagojev, and I am a professor of organization studies at Technische Universität Dresden, Germany. And in my research, I focus on developing a temporal lens on organizations and organizing. A temporal lens draws on time-related concepts such as pacing, timing, rhythm, time horizons, and temporal work to generate new insights on previously hidden or perhaps neglected dimensions of organizational and managerial phenomena. So in this video, I would like to invite you to take a different perspective on the topic of organizing in times of crisis, one that centers on questions of time and temporality. And in addition, also to reflect upon how such a temporal lens can illuminate various aspects of the ongoing war in Ukraine. To that end, I'm first going to develop an understanding of crisis as a temporal concept, a phenomenon that unfolds in time and with distinct time-related characteristics that call for what scholars refer to as temporal work, individual or collective efforts to strategically influence the temporal dimensions of organizing. In the next step, I'm going to introduce you to three temporal lenses, each of which draws attention to a distinct manifestation of time in organizing. As you will see, each lens helps in understanding distinct aspects of how organizations respond to crisis situations. And then finally, I'm going to apply these insights to the case of war and armed conflict which, from a temporal lens, can be understood as contests of timing. Contests in which multiple adversaries leverage time as a resource to achieve their diametrically opposed strategic goals. In this respect, I'm also going to invite you to critically reflect upon the dominance of short-term horizons uh, and fast-paced orientations in Western organizations and institutions. At this stage, you might be asking yourself, why should I even care about time and temporality when thinking about organizing in times of crisis? Well, to begin with, the very concept of crisis implies time. The word crisis derives, as is so often the case, from the ancient Greek verb krino, which means to decide, to separate or to judge. Crisis then refers to a decisive moment, a turning point or a disruption that puts a stop to the regular flow of events and opens up multiple possibilities and potentially opposing outcomes. Finally, crises are usually settled through organizational efforts that perhaps enact something that we now call a new normal. We have seen both during the pandemic and during the current war in Ukraine how such disruptions caused by crisis look like. During the pandemic, for instance, regular work routines were disrupted for large parts of the population. For some, such as those working in retail or gastronomy, they were even put on hold for a long period of time. For others, like us in academia, New work routines based on digitalization, such as online teaching, had to be literally invented out of thin air with an unprecedented speed. Time is also inherent in the concept of crisis in a second way. Disruptions are often not singular events with a clearly circumscribed duration, but rather unfold in time with their distinct rhythms. Rhythms that are often also very difficult to predict. Again, think about how we have experienced such rhythms in terms of the multiple waves of the pandemic and are also currently experiencing them in terms of the unregular and often unpredictable flow of events and battles in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Yet disruptions caused by crisis situations are also interesting analytically because they expose dimensions or aspects of organizational and social practice that are usually not reflected upon or taken for granted in the normal course of events. And one such dimension is time. Time is complex. 
The pandemic, for instance, has forcefully propelled this realization beyond expert scholarly circles, taken for granted understandings of time as objective, absolute, linear and reliable as time measured by the clocks have been profoundly disrupted. Suddenly during lockdowns, scheduling even the most banal events had become a challenge because it was difficult to predict how the pandemic might develop in the near term, let alone in the distant future. Questions of time also pervaded our response to the pandemic. Flattening the curve, for example, was a strategy that essentially tried to slow down the spread of the virus by reducing the number of physical contacts, thus enabling the healthcare system to gain time necessary to handle, to treat pa patients without overflowing. Simultaneously, slowed down activity for some implied an accelerated pace for others, such as pharmaceutical companies who were developing vaccines at an unprecedented speed. Time is also at the heart of the climate crisis and sustainability. Indeed, one of the main reasons for the current climate crisis is that our socio-technical systems, in particular businesses, can release energy stored in fossil fuels at a rate that is by orders of magnitude faster than the pace with which natural systems can adapt. The temporal rhythms of socio-technical and natural systems are, so to speak, out of joint. At the same time, sustainability calls for deep level behavioral shifts that would enable us to meet the, de the demands of the present without compromising the capacity of future generations to meet their needs. An organizational challenge that requires us to learn how to translate distant future goals into present day activity. Questions of time also particularly pervade war and armed conflict. We have seen how expectations for a fast-paced Russian blitzkrieg, which would go for no longer than a couple of days or weeks, were cast down by the Ukrainian resistance, resulting in a crisis marked by an unclear temporal horizon. It is difficult to predict whether we are dealing with a relatively short-term disruption or perhaps a more a protracted military conflict that could go on for years or even decades. All these examples suggest that time is much more complex than we commonly assume. It is not simply a neutral background continuum in which organizing and management simply happen and can be located at different points in time. Rather, it is a fundamental dimension that is also actively made and remade and also influenced through organizational and social practices. Wars and armed conflicts are particularly interesting in this regard because they also expose the political nature of time. The fact that time is imbued with values and is oftentimes used and abused instrumentally by actors who seek to achieve political goals. For example, after the French Revolution, there were attempts to establish a new calendar in France, the so-called Jacobin or Republican calendar, which deviated significantly from our Gregorian calendar. The beginning of a new historical era, it seems, had to be marked also by a shift in how time was measured and tracked. The Republican calendar did not eventually take hold in France, but in other situations, such as politi such politically motivated interventions in time were more successful. For example, after the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, the newly installed pro-Russian government, as one of its first acts, moved time two hours forward in order to synchronize with the Russian time zone, an event that was accompanied by large-scale public celebrations. Wars and armed conflicts are also often framed in terms of clashing temporalities. For example, in 2014, former US Secretary of State John Kerry declared, you just don't in the 21st century behave in a 19th century fashion by invading another country on completely trumped up pretext. And similar descriptions were also expressed in relation to the ongoing war in Ukraine. These examples show that time is deeply intertwined with questions of power and politics, and this is also often strategically influenced by actors who seek to achieve certain goals.
Such attempts at influencing time and temporality are captured analytically by the notion of temporal work. Temporal work refers to individual, collective or organizational efforts to influence, sustain or redirect the temporal assumptions or patterns that shape strategic and organizational action. The notion of temporal work underlines that organizations can actively and strategically build, create, make and leverage time to various ends. They can influence how time is reckoned and valued, they can engage in attempts to redirect the flow of time and its rhythms, not least through military interventions. But they can also attempt to sustain certain temporal patterns and assumptions, especially when facing crisis situations marked by uncertainty and disruption. So temporal work underlines that organizations can actively influence time. But what are the specific dimensions of time or targets of temporal work? Research on time and organizing has focused on three distinct manifestations of time and organizations, each of which can be the target of temporal work, especially in times of crisis. The first dimension, time as structure, manifests in organizations as a socio-temporal order that facilitates coordination by shaping the rhythms of organizational activities. As a structure, time manifests in the particular temporal patterns of organizational activities, for instance, in terms of sequence or duration. It also manifests in the temporal orientations towards past, present and future that are enacted by such activities. Finally, it also manifests in the temporal experiences of organizational actors who navigate temporally structured organizational settings. The key question here is how do organizations create, maintain and occasionally change their socio-temporal order? The second dimension, time as process, foregrounds the interplay of past, present and future in organizing. Of particular interest here is how organizations Organizational actors confront various and changing challenges in the present, which may make them reimagine the future, rethink the past, and therefore also reconsider the focus of their present day activity. The key question here, therefore, is how do actors enact a sense of continuity among their past, present and projected future activities as they move through and in time? And then finally, Time also manifests as a resource that organizations can leverage to achieve strategic ends. As a resource, time manifests in attempts to leverage the timing of activities, for example, to seize the right moment for a new product launch. But it also manifests in the strategic pacing of activities, for example, when trying to outmaneuver or outpace competitors. And it can also manifest in leveraging distinct time horizons that accommodate both short-term and long-term strategic goals. Now let's have a closer look at how organizations engage in temporal work in relation to each of those dimensions, especially in times of crisis. From the perspective of time as structure, a key challenge in crisis situations relates to the maintenance of temporal order when facing situations marked by a high level of temporal uncertainty, when in other words, it is not possible to re reliably predict how events will unfold in the near future. Let's take the example of firefighters. Firefighters have to routinely handle situations, crisis situations with high temporal uncertainty. Often they simply do not know what to expect at the beginning of an operation and can only assess the situation upon arrival at the fire site. A recent study shows that in such situations of temporal uncertainty, the success of firefighting operations crucially depends on their capacity to temporarily uncouple from the ongoing and often chaotic flow of events at the fire site. Rather than acting and reacting immediately, Firefighters try to produce an assessment of the situation first and then devise a temporal order, a distinct sequence according to which different firefighting routines are to be performed. In other words, temporarily uncoupling or detaching from the flow of events enables firefighters to gain temporal autonomy 
to be able to select their own courses of action instead of having it imposed onto them by the situation. And so during firefighters were literally able to get ahead of time and maintain a temporal order despite the unfavorable conditions. As put by one of the firefighters who were interviewed in the study, the worst is if you run behind, then you lose grip of the situation and focus. All our efforts are geared towards getting ahead of time. We need to be in control and know what happens next. The notion of temporal uncoupling thus underlines how important it is to switch from a passive reactive mode to a more agentic autonomous mode of action when organizing in times of crisis. There are, however, crisis situations which are so disruptive that maintaining any sort of continuous temporal order based on routines is not that easy. Take the example of natural disasters such as Hurricane Katrina, which hit the city of New Orleans in the United States in 2005 and caused catastrophic damage, disrupting the provision of basic services such as housing, medical services, education, and even the criminal justice system for years. From the perspective of time as process, the key challenge in such disruptive circumstances is how to restore a sense of continuity when regular organizational activities and routines are so radically disrupted. Continuity is relatively straightforward when we are facing regular situations that are not marked by disruption. In the regular case, we can simply extrapolate from past and present experience into the future and enact continuity based on repetitive action patterns and routines with only small adjustments. This, however, is not possible in the case of severe disruptions that simply cancel out any possibility to continue doing things as you have been doing them in the past, simply because the material infrastructure has been so severely damaged that buildings are destroyed or flooded. Research shows that in such situations, actors can engage in a form of temporal work called continuity patterning, basically trying to invent new patterns of action that can support the enactment of specific services, such as mental health care, in the new and transformed situation. Continuity patterning is a process that entails several steps. First, actors can take actions through provisional adjusting, for example, by trying to continue their work, but in new settings. In the Katrina case, psychotherapists, for example, started seeing clients in undamaged coffee shops and schools and hotels turned into new homeless shelters. Second, over time, actors began connecting such provisional actions or improvisations uh, into new paths, which were often novel and creative. Initial provisional actions, such as offering mental health care in schools, over time coalesced into successful new routines that, that did not exist prior to the disaster. Finally, the process of continuity patterning resulted in shifts in the overall pattern of mental health care that had emerged from ongoing experimentation and improvisation and were not mandated externally. This example shows that crisis can also be an opportunity for change and can even end up creating new patterns of action or transforming existing organizational trajectories. However, both the firefighters and the Katrina examples focus on crisis situations with a relatively compact temporal scale. They unfold over several hours or perhaps days and months. There are, however, crises that we are currently facing, such as the climate crisis, that have a much larger temporal scale, partially going beyond the lifetime of single individuals. Such crises are often more difficult to tackle because they are perceived as more psychologically distant and thus not that urgent, even though they are actually urgent in reality. This, of course, poses the question, how can we deal with such crisis situations of large temporal scale? Now, research shows that in relation to such crises, time horizons play a crucial role as a temporal resource. 
To be able to handle crisis with a large temporal scale, organizations need to embrace a longer term horizon that can reshape how decisions are being made in the present, while at the same time maintaining a certain degree of continuity in their present day activities. This, however, often creates an intertemporal tension between, especially uh, in some environments, in particular market environments, which have a very strong normative preference for short-term benefits and quick financial gain. Investments in sustainable technologies that could help reduce carbon emissions are thus oftentimes turned down due to their long payback periods. And other investments with shorter-term profitability are given priority. So what can organizations do to extend their time horizons and engage in more long-term strategizing? Several things. On a, on a very general level, studies have shown that organizations that are able to look back at a very long and distant history, often comprising multiple centuries, are usually also better able to look into and think about the more distant consequences of their present day actions so they can see more deeply into the future. In addition, studies have shown that distinct organizational practices can be linked to the length of organizational time horizons. For example, organizations that engage in longer term thinking normally utilize both quantitative but also qualitative planning techniques, which provide multidimensional data on climate change. In addition, they also engage with external stakeholders in a more intensive and dialogic way, thus maintaining a more complex understanding of climate change is a wicked problem with various attributes. These organizations also engage in extensive industry and cross-sector co collaborations, which broadens the solution space of the climate change problem. Overall, these organizations with longer term horizons were able to see short term drops in performance as temporary or even necessary for the success of the long term transition to sustainable business practices. Most organizations, however, remain focused on the short term. They usually draw on quantitative planning techniques uh, that try to translate climate change into quantifiable economic models thereby often discounting the value of the future. They are also less inclined to engage with stakeholders or to maintain cross-sector collaborations. This ending up with a very narrow view of climate change is a financial or technological problem that should be resolved with traditional means. Such research shows that a key problem underlying organizational inaction towards, climate, towards the climate crisis has to do with the dominance of short-term temporal orientations in organizations. In most cases, organizations still prefer fast-paced action to slow long-term results. So why is this the case? This preference for short-term uh, gains and fast results is deeply embedded in many economic institutions and models which are widely applied in business practice, including the discounted cash flow method but also in quarterly financial reporting cycles and budget cycles, which usually take one year. Even the four-year election cycles in many democratic countries favors a short-term orientations as polit politicians are more likely to favor projects and initiatives that are likely to guarantee re-election within that time frame. Economic models normally devalue the future cash flow because the latter are seen as riskier and more uncertain. Depending on the discount rate that is applied, the value of outcomes that are a couple of decades into the future can even approximate zero. Such examples show that assumptions about time are deeply intertwined with values. Time, in other words, is not neutral. How we relate to time and how we use time how we approach time is a critical expression of our values, of what we consider more or less important in our societies. And questions of time, as we have seen, are also often very deeply embedded in our social and economic institutions and practices. Now, interestingly, such taken for granted assumptions about time 
and preferences for short-term results and fast-paced action can also be observed in relation to warfare and armed conflicts and the ways in which those are approached organizationally. A key difference between wars and armed conflicts on the one hand and other types of crises, such as natural disasters or fires on the other hand, is that in an armed conflict both sides can engage in temporal work. That is, they can attempt to strategically influence the timing, the pace, and also the time horizons of their activities, dynamically, in relation to each other. Therefore, wars can also be understood as timing contests, situations in which approaches to and assumptions about how time as a resource can be used clash with each other and shape the rhythms and the outcomes of the conflict. Take the example of the Vietnam War, a 20-year-long 20 20 year conflict officially fought between North and South Vietnam, though with the support of various allies. North Vietnam was supported, among others, by communist countries such as the Soviet Union and China, and South Vietnam was supported primarily by the United States and its anti-communist allies. In the words of political scientist Andrew Hom, in the case of the Vietnam War, timing clashes were crucial. American war planners assumed that the National Liberation Front, NLF, of Vietnam could not weather an extended conflict, either economically or militarily. However, the NLF prolonged the war and weakened American resolve by creatively retiming the social relations of its personnel. These new procedures produced better unit cohesion by prescribing lengthy activity change, chains in, in between brief periods of combat. This allowed the NLF to retard its operational pace, to become slower. A protracted conflict confounded American leaders' expectations and desires for a quick war and also inhibited public support. The Vietnam War exemplifies what war scholar Olivier Schmidt has called the dominant wartime paradigm of the West. A taken for granted set of assumptions and preferences that shape how Western military institutions and organizations have approached war ever since the Cold War period. According to Schmidt, this war wartime paradigm consists of two key assumptions. First, the assumption that military operations should be optimized for speed and a short-term victory. Underlying this assumption is the insight that lengthy conflicts are costly, both in financial terms and in terms of casualties. The idea was that advances in information technology should enable Western military forces to outpace their adversaries, basically accelerating all aspects of warfare. And second, that the assumption that military operations should be handled as a form of risk management, basically legitimizing preemptive strikes to police and crush enemies' activities before they are even able to realize those activities. Think about the Iraq, the war in Iraq, which at least officially aimed at preventing Iraq and its leader, Saddam Hussein, former leader Saddam Hussein, from using its program for uh, we weapons for mass destruction, a program which, as we know now, never really existed in that way. The problem with this assumption then is, according to Schmidt, that it leads directly to never-ending military operations. Cyclical, open-ended approaches remain necessary since risks cannot be completely eliminated and require constant management. The concept of wartime paradigm shows that timing as a form of temporal work is performed in wars and armed conflicts does not happen, happen in vacuum. Rather, it is shaped by larger narratives and imaginaries that often build on problematic assumptions about time, such as the assumption that preemptive war can be fought at a high pace and with a short-term victorious outcome. Such assumptions, however, according to Schmidt, increasingly clash with the existing realities of war, which is no longer fought only on the battleground, but also in the digital space, for example, in the form of 
of information warfare. Indeed, we are also currently experiencing such a clash of different timing regimes in the case of the Ukraine war. As widely agreed by commentators, Putin's original plan for a fast-paced short-term blitzkrieg, or a military operation as he calls it, failed and we are now facing a more protracted conflict with an unclear outcome. So what are some of the conclusions that we can draw from this temporal take or temporal lens on organizing in times of crisis? First and most importantly, I hope that this mini lecture made it clear why organizing in times of crisis crucially depends on the skillful performance of temporal work. More specifically, I have shown how temporal work matters in relation to three manifestations of time in organizing. First, in relation to time as structure, temporal work can aim at recreating a sense of temporal order amidst temporal uncertainty. Second, in relation to time as process, temporal work matters in terms of enacting a sense of continuity amidst disruption. And then finally, in relation to time as resource, Temporal work matters as a means of leveraging multiple time horizons and regimes of timing and pacing strategic action. Applying these insights to the case of war and armed conflict, I suggested that the latter can be understood as a special form of crisis, one in which multiple parties engage in timing contests while acting within their own wartime paradigms that shape preferences and assumptions about time. In particular, the dominant Western paradigm of short-term victory and fast-paced military operations might be increasingly becoming problematic, not least because it's clashing with various new developments that favor a more slow-paced and protracted forms of warfare. Within this new situation, faster, we have seen, might not always be better. As a post-lecture assignment, I would like to invite you to apply your newly gained knowledge about the temporal lens to the case of Ukraine. The assignment read as fo reads as follows. How could we explain the failure of Putin's blitzkrieg in Ukraine from the perspective of war as a timing contest? In your response, think especially about what you have learned about temporal uncoupling, continuity patterning and time horizons, and how these concepts could help you to understand how Ukraine was able to slow down the, the pace of the war. And importantly, as always, try to support your argument with specific examples. So that was all for uh, this mini lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, in case of any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me via email or any other means. Thank you. <laughs>